Well, thank you, Jim. This morning we're in Mark chapter 5 as we continue our series here in the book of Mark. I've entitled this message this morning, The Ultimate Miracle, and we've kind of been on this journey and we've been moving up uh, to a miracle of, of grand proportions is truly um, what we see here this morning. I don't know about you, but um, promises that are not kept are not good. Would you agree with that? It's kind of like the Old Testament says that uh, hope deferred makes the heart sad. That's the old King James version of that. Uh, but truly, you get the meaning of it. Uh, if you tell the kids that you're going to take them to Chuck E. Cheese, you better make sure that you follow through with that and you accomplish that. Otherwise, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. There are many promises that God's Word has made to you and I. Uh, God's Word has many prophecies, as we know, and many, many prophecies have been fulfilled already. But when we think about the ultimate miracle, the ultimate miracle yields itself as proof that the eternal life, the everlasting life promise that falls to each one who places their faith in Jesus Christ is truly substantiated. In other words, it's not like it's a promise that God is not going to keep. It would be kind of like you making a promise to someone and there's no way for you really to fulfill that promise. You kind of make the promise, but you know that in reality, you just can't follow through. God has made a promise to those who call upon the name of the Lord to be their Savior. Jesus would forgive us of our sins, cleanse us from that unrighteousness. We understand that as such, that he grants to us eternal life, everlasting life because our sins are paid for by Jesus Christ. But is that a promise that God can keep? Fair question. Easy answer. And this morning, the promises here are substantiated by two miracles that we're going to witness as things take on another dimension in the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's look to the scriptures this morning and let's notice here in verse 21 that when Jesus had crossed over again in the boat to the other side, a large crowd gathered around him. And so he stayed by the seashore and one of the synagogue officials named Jairus came up and on seeing him fell at his feet and implored him earnestly saying, my little daughter is at the point of death. Please come and lay your hands on her so that she will get well and live. And he went off with him and a large crowd was following him and pressing in as he was going. Now that's the first aspect of the story here this morning. It's a story within a story, as it were, because by the time we get down to verse 35, we're going to actually leave for a little bit and then come back to this main story. But there is, or there are, two people of great significance here besides Jesus. And Jairus is the first one, a synagogue official, and we'll talk more about that in a moment. But picking us up here, as we notice in verse 25, there was a woman as well who's part of the story. The Bible says there was a woman who had a hemorrhage for 12 years and it endured much at the hand of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was not helped at all, but rather had gotten worse. After hearing about Jesus, she came up in the crowd behind him and touched his cloak. For she thought, if I just touch his garments, I will get well. well. These are the two people in this story, and we're going to explore some of the differences that they had, as well as some of the similarities that they had. And I trust that as we embrace this ultimate miracle that Jesus performs here, that our hearts will be encouraged, because it definitely has impact for each one of us. But before we go any further, let's ask the Lord to bless the Word of God this morning, shall we? Our Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for the word of God that you have given to us. Lord, truly, we are about to see this ultimate miracle. 
and truly be encouraged. May this word be a blessing to each one who's here today. And may we walk from here with a greater assurance of our faith. And I pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. We meet this woman, and we're going to pick up uh, here with the middle section of this uh, passage. And we're going to see how Jesus is able to, or has the power, to reward personal faith. We see this woman here in this passage. You just got through reading with me. And her mentality was that things are bad, but if I could just touch the hem of the garment of Jesus... Jesus would heal me. Now what she has in common with the crowd and what she is really unique in and different from the crowd are two separate things, but I want you to see here that for this woman, she had some things in common with this crowd that was pressing against Jesus. Verse 24, Jesus goes off with Jairus and this large crowd is following him and they're pressing in on him. You can just imagine how this crowd must have been pushing up against Jesus, and Jesus is almost getting jostled around as he's walking with this crowd. And this woman takes this risk by seeking to get close enough to Jesus to just be able to touch his garment, thinking that if she was able to touch his garment, she would be made well. It was risky for this woman to do it, because the hemorrhage that she had made her ceremonially unclean. In fact, once the bleeding would have stopped, she could have gone to the synagogue, she would have to be scrutinized and then declared clean. It would have had to stop for a minimum of seven days. But once it had stopped for seven days, she could go and she could be declared clean. Why is that important? Well, that was important because you couldn't worship in the synagogue any synagogue, and you couldn't certainly worship in the temple if you were unclean. And so here there's this woman, and she's not able to, to worship God at all because of this. And it's gone on, the Bible says, for how long? Twelve years. That's a long period of time, isn't it? Twelve years. And she is thinking to herself, I just really need to be made well from this. And there were implications, folks. This was like having leprosy. Because even her family and her friends couldn't get close to her for fear that they would also become unclean for associating with her. They couldn't touch her. They couldn't put their arm around her and say, I'm praying for you without being unclean themselves and having to go through this rite of purification. So she was cast off from society. She was rejected and she was cast aside. And it was a very difficult burden for her to deal with. Beyond that, she was experiencing tremendous difficulties at the hands of the doctors. In fact, all of her money went to trying to be healed. Uh, she desired to be healed, and, and nothing was working. In Jesus' day, there were, there were these shrines of healing where the false pagan gods would supposedly heal a person. But some of the weirdness of that time period, and it's actually out of these shrines that, that medicine began to grow and they began to seek uh, different uh, ways to be able to heal people. But it's interesting. It's actually pretty fascinating. Uh, they found that, uh, they, well, they tried it. it. It just really didn't work out. But if, they thought if you ate the liver of a fox, it would, would help you. I think it just tasted terrible. Uh, they also saw that the juices from an iris plant would somehow do something for you, and that proved to be worthless as well. It just tasted bad. Ugh. There was no hope. This woman realized that there was absolutely nothing that she could do to be made well, and so she struggled to find a cure. She got to the point, however, where it really didn't matter anymore. She realized that her only hope after hearing about Jesus was Jesus. And she was willing to get into that crowd and hopefully not be recognized by people because she's unclean and they're jostling back and forth. In fact, she must have made a lot of people unclean that day. But she was willing to take that risk because she knew he was her only, only hope. Now what she has in common with the crowd is this. Just like everyone in that crowd, they all had a spiritual need. 
She had a need to be healed. But it wasn't only her physical healing that was significant. It was also her spiritual healing. Because she had a problem just like you and I have a problem, and that problem is with our sin. See, we have a sin problem, and our sin problem is so bad that unless Jesus is our Savior and he's forgiven our sin and he becomes uh, the one who has washed away our sin, we have an accountability for that sin. And that's a desperate situation. You see, everyone in that crowd, jostling back and forth, had the same spiritual need. They needed Jesus and they needed deliverance and they needed it now. Difference is she recognized it. And the Bible tells us here, if you look carefully, that she heard about Jesus and she thought in her heart, if I touch his garments, I'll get well. She knew she had a need. She couldn't miss that. But she also had faith. After she heard about Jesus, she thought, I'm going to take the risk because she had faith in Jesus. And that sets her apart, and that makes her unique and different from all the rest in the crowd. Now, when this happens, the Bible says that she touched Jesus' hem, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. And immediately Jesus perceived in himself that power had gone out from him, and he turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my garments? Does anybody here think Jesus didn't know who touched his garment? Of course he did. Why does he ask this question? Because he wants her to come forward. And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing in on you and you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see the woman. See, he knew who it was, who had done this. But the woman was fearing and trembling, aware of what happened to her, and she came and fell down before him. And she told the whole truth. She said, this was my problem. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. How startling it must have been to the crowd when Jesus declared that her faith had made her well. She now could go to the synagogue and she could be analyzed by the synagogue officials. She could go to the temple and the priests would be able to declare her clean. She could offer that sacrifice now. You know, Jesus was really good for their business. Think of how many people are coming along and saying, hey, I I was just healed by Jesus. What do I have to do? Oh, another one's healed by Jesus. What is that, the hundredth one today? I mean, there's a whole crowd there, and Jesus is doing all of these healings. It must have been really cool. And here is this woman now, and Jesus is saying, your faith has made you well. And now she could go back, and she could go through that that purification process. This poor woman had had a great affliction. He says, go in peace and be healed of that affliction. The word affliction here is the word we would translate it to other places, whip or scourge. When you think of Jesus being scourged, those were those leather pieces with metal and glass at the end and It would be tearing the skin off of the person who was whipped or scourged. It shows the level of suffering that this woman went through. But what is so exciting about this is the word that that Jesus uses when he says that you've been made well. The Greek word sozo is a Greek word that's usually tied to salvation. And in fact, if you look at the New Testament, it's exclusively used for a person who's being saved from their sin. So here's this woman, and she is made well. Jesus was looking beyond her physical affliction, and he was looking at the need of her soul because her faith had led to her salvation, you see. Isn't that exciting? She had this deep faith in Jesus. She just knew he could heal her. And and she thought so much so of Jesus that she thought to herself, he doesn't even have to stop or slow down. If I can just touch his cloak, I'll be healed. That's some good faith, isn't it? That's some tremendous faith. And that is exactly what happens with this woman. In the midst of everything that's going on, verse 35 tells us that Jesus receives word that he doesn't need to hurry to Jairus' home. Notice here, 
Verse 35, while he was still speaking, while he was saying, daughter, your faith has made you well, go in peace and be healed of your affliction. While he's saying that, they came from the house of the synagogue official saying, your daughter has died. Why trouble the teacher anymore? And Jesus hears this, and he says to the synagogue official, don't be afraid, only believe. Don't, don't be fearful. You see, Jesus has the power to reward personal faith. He has the power to deliver us from our sin. And he says, just believe. Well, you know, it's an interesting aspect here of Jesus' powers. Jesus has done some amazing things. Remember when the, the man who had the demonic spirit pops up in the synagogue right in the beginning of the ministry, and Jesus says, okay, that's enough of that, kicks him out, and the, the, the man is, is made well, right? Uh, you know, there's been a lot of healings. Uh, there, there's um, Peter's mother-in-law. There's all these people. They're coming left and right, and then you have these major miracles. So we're kind of tracking in degree. So we have Jesus out there on the water, and as he's out there on the water, it's an amazing experience. The boat's filling with water, and Jesus stills the storm. So Jesus has this power over nature, whereby even the storm, even the winds, obey him. And the disciples marvel at that. They just, they can't wrap their head around the power that Jesus has. Get over to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, and what do we face there? A demoniac who is filled with unclean spirits. And Jesus uh, doesn't hesitate whatsoever. He's able to cast those out and deliver that man, so much so that that demoniac, as we talked about last Sunday, is now in his right mind. He's sitting there, he's talking, and he's excited about going back to the Gadareans and tell them about Jesus and his great love. Jesus has some awesome power. Would you agree with that? Is there any limitations to the power of Jesus Christ? That's a key question. It's one thing to heal someone who's sick. It's one thing that someone who seems to be even on death's door can be pulled back from death's door and revived to the point where they're able to live. It's possible to put electric paddles on someone's chest when their hearts stopped beating and the shock from that can get their heart to start beating. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? But isn't there a limitation that once a person dies, no one can bring them back from the dead. Can they? You see, in the people's minds, they're following Jesus. They're coming to Jesus for miracles all the time. But don't blame them for thinking. Maybe there's a limitation. Maybe Jesus can only do so much. So they come to Jesus and they say, Jarius, don't waste your time. She's already dead. Now, Jarius was a synagogue official, the Bible says. He was one of a group of men, maybe three to seven men would generally be the officials who would be over each one of the synagogues. And every one of those synagogues had these officials because the officials kept track and making sure that the scrolls were taken care of. They took care of the facilities. They did administrative work. They oversaw the teaching. They had a lot of responsibility. And they were kind of part of the whole Jewish leadership group, thinking Sadducees, Pharisees, everybody else you see, you know, that's, that's part of that, right? They're kind of embedded in the, in, in the whole bureaucracy. Do you follow me? But Jarius sees something just like the woman saw something. And that was that his only hope was in Jesus. It's amazing how when we have crises, we suddenly pray. People who are agnostic, people who are atheists, find themselves facing something and they have no control whatsoever. And all of a sudden, they want to ask Jesus for help. 
This man realizes there is no help other than Jesus for his daughter. When he first sees Jesus, he looks at Jesus as the deliverer for his daughter because his daughter is at the point of death. Notice in that first part, when we were reading verse 21, you come to verse 22, Jesus is, is told that he, he's implored by this man. He's beseeched by this man, Jairus. In Jesus' ministry, do you ever get the feeling there's like, like a crisis every day? Like, or two or three? I mean, it's like somebody's always imploring him to do something, like beseeching him. I mean, there's always an emergency. It's, you just can't have a normal day, right? And, and here's this man, and, and he realizes that in Jesus, there, there is hope there. And so he comes to Jesus with this urgency and this expectancy. And now he's told his daughter has died. Do you think part of him was angry because Jesus had hesitated and talked to that woman? And maybe Jesus had just gone faster. If maybe the crowd could have just let Jesus alone a little bit so that he could have gotten there sooner. But now there's, there's no hope. There's, there's no point. All hope seems to be lost. And that's when Jesus turns to him and says, don't be afraid, only believe. And the Bible says, and he allowed no one to accompany him except for Peter, James, and John to go into the house of this official. And he saw a commotion and people loudly weeping and wailing. And entering in, he said to them, why make a commotion and weep? The child has not died but is asleep. Now, this was quite a scene. You could have heard the weeping and the wailing from a long distance because funerals in Jesus' day are very different than funerals today. If you go to a funeral home today, there's usually organ music playing on the speakers, right? Whoever picks that music? But it's very somber, isn't it? It generally is very somber, especially among those in the world who do not have hope, like a believer has hope. There, there's a, there's a, a, a sadness with, without any hope of the eternal life or the future, and, and so it's a, it's a depressing time, and so it's very subdued. Not in Jesus' day. There were certain things that happened when there was a funeral in Jesus' day. One of the things that they would do is they would rend their clothes. They would tear their clothes to show their grief. Do you know, just in keeping with Jewish tradition, there were 39 regulations attached to how you tear your clothes the correct way? Isn't that amazing? 39. Second thing you did was you always hired professional mourners. These were people that knew how to weep and wail, and they could really set the tone. And so you had to hire them. It was really important. And then you would hire flutists. And the flutists would come in and the flutists would play and they would play dissonant sounds. That is, they didn't play a melody. They would, well, kind of like your kid when they were in fourth grade learning an instrument. You remember that? They played a lot of dissonant sounds. And, and that's the way it would be. And, and you'd have this all going on, this, this commotion. And even the poorest people were expected to hire at least two flutists and one whaler. And so everybody's, this was what Jesus encountered. And when Jesus came in, he basically said to them, you all need to leave. And so it went from this volume of all this weeping and wailing and crazy music to nothing, quiet. And they all left. And I think they went out into the community and they said, what in the world is Jesus going to do? Notice when Jesus tells them this, that they began laughing at him. They were laughing at Jesus. You see, there's got to be a limitation to what Jesus can do, right? I mean, there has to be a limitation. Certainly, he's not capable of raising the dead. But that's exactly what Jesus is capable of. So he goes in there and the Bible says he takes the family and they come into this room where the child was. In verse 41, Jesus takes the child by the hand, and he says to her, Talitha kum, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. You can see the compassion of Jesus here, can't you? Just like when Jesus said to the demoniac, go back to the Gadareans and the Decapolis and, and tell them about the love that has been shown to you today. You see the Savior exhibiting this love here again. So when Jesus says to this little girl, 
I say to you, get up. What do you think's going to happen? Is anybody here doubting what's going to happen? There's got to be limitations. But notice verse 42. Immediately the girl got up, and she began to walk, for she was 12 years old. And immediately they were completely astounded. And he gave them strict orders. No one should know about this. And he said that something should be given to this little girl to eat. Here we see the power of Jesus to rescue us from our worst enemy. Do you realize that when Jesus says that he has the power to grant to us eternal life, that was a significant statement? For we find, as the Thessalonian church is a great example of this, they wondered about the power of the resurrection because they were understanding that they would never die a physical death. And now, as the time is going by, they're waiting for Jesus to return. And as the time is going by, some in the church are passing away. And as they're passing away, it's begging the question, what is going to happen to those people? Are they going to miss the day of the Lord? Fair question. And God says, no. In fact, those who are dead in Christ will rise first and precede those who will then meet Jesus in the air. You see, this is the ultimate miracle because the last enemy to be vanquished is death. This was huge. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 points out to us the significance of of what Jesus has done. For the Bible would tell us here that truly Jesus is the first fruits of those who are asleep. And he goes on and he says in verse 51, behold, I tell you a mystery, we will not all sleep, not a euphemism for death, but we will, he says, all be changed. For this perishable has to put on imperishable. Why is that so? It's because your body and my body is not capable of living for eternity in the kingdom of heaven. That's my problem. That's your problem. It just isn't capable. I'm not wired for that. Because sin entered the world and I'm a sinner, the reality is this body is corrupted. And this body is no longer equipped to live for eternity. But one day it will be changed. And that's what he says there in that passage in 1 Corinthians 15. But we will all, we must all, every, we must all be changed. Even if you're alive, when the rapture takes place, you're going to have to experience the reception of a new body. And your new body will live for eternity in the kingdom of heaven. Wouldn't that be great? There'll be no sorrowing there. There'll be no sickness there. There'll be no sin there. Isn't that wonderful? You see, what Jesus did was in raising this girl, he showed his power over death. How wonderful that truly is. And that's why it goes on here. And he says uh, there in verse 54 that death is swallowed up in victory. Isn't that great news? Here was this little girl. And Jesus came along and, and death was swallowed up in victory. He goes on and he says, oh, death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. What a blessing. How does this miracle affect us? Jesus' power to raise the dead is an integral part of my faith. 1 Corinthians 15 says, if there's no resurrection of the dead, Paul goes on and he says, then our preachings in vain. You know what that word vain means? Worthless. It doesn't accomplish anything. You might as well do something else on Sunday mornings. Don't come and worship. If there's no resurrection, there's no point. But that's the point. There is a resurrection. And Jesus has demonstrated his power, and he does that with Jairus' daughter. How wonderful that truly was. And Jesus did it with Lazarus after he was dead for four days. And Jesus Christ comes back from the tomb, coming out of that tomb, 100% human. Jesus' body lay there dead in the tomb. His spirit is with the Lord, but he is resurrected and he conquers death. Is that great news? I think that's something as Christians we should get excited about. I really do. I think that should just absolutely thrill us that in death there is no victory. 
It's been swallowed up. And Jesus Christ has done that. He has performed the ultimate miracle. Now thinking through these two people in the story, think about this Jairus and think about the woman who had the hemorrhage. What are their differences? Well, their differences are several. One's a man, one's a woman. That's an obvious one, right? But he's wealthy and she's poor. She spent every nickel on medicine that didn't work. He's respected. She's rejected by society because she's unclean. He's honored. He's an official in the synagogue, but she is ashamed. He leads the synagogue while she's excommunicated from worship. He has a 12-year-old child, and she has a 12-year-old affliction. But what did these two people have in common? That's a better question maybe to ask. First of all, they had a need that could not be met by any power in this world. They needed Jesus desperately. And based upon that need that they had, they both had faith in Jesus. They both believed that Jesus was the answer. And they were rewarded for their faith. Jesus Christ healed them. In the case of the Jairus, it's his daughter. In the case of the woman, it's her self. Some things for us to stop and think about. Jesus is able to rescue us from our greatest afflictions, including our greatest enemy, which is death. And that's peace to know that, isn't it? Second of all, we need to pursue the need for rescue. Pursue Jesus with an urgency. Both of these people were willing to be perceived by the world as, as somewhat bizarre. This woman was able to take this risk. She would have been in big trouble if they found out that this unclean woman had been touching all those people in the crowd, but she, she saw an urgency, and, and nothing was going to stop her from pursuing Jesus. Jairus could have been mocked by the officials in Jerusalem. In fact, they were already hawking every move Jesus made. And so when, when Jairus came forward, they knew about it. My friends, you and I, if we sense our need for the Savior... It doesn't matter what the world thinks. It doesn't matter what parents think. It doesn't matter what, what anyone in our world thinks. If you're here today and Jesus Christ is speaking to your heart and you feel the, the, the urgency to place your faith in Jesus Christ, don't let anything stop you. Put your faith in Jesus Christ today and be delivered from that sin. And last but not least, we're reminded that what led to the salvation of each of these two people was faith in Jesus Christ. You see, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Do you have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? I trust that you do. Faith that not only will he deliver you from the power of that sin, forgiving you of your sin and giving to you eternal life, an eternal life that he has substantially proven that he can deliver on, a real true promise that he shows absolutely he has the power to do. You see, I have no doubt that if I pass away and my spirit is in heaven, that one day Jesus Christ will resurrect me out of that grave and he will give to me a new body because it's easy for him to do that you see the power of Jesus Christ and we're blessed by that would you bow your heads for a moment with me please how I encourage you today to consider Jesus to stop and think about Jesus Christ and what he has accomplished on the cross for you. Have you placed your faith in him? Do you have assurance today that if this was your last day on this earth, that you would be in his presence for eternity? If you're lacking that assurance, may I urge you this morning to place your faith in Christ and Christ alone. If we trust in our good works, we'll never have that assurance because we'll never know if we're good enough. If we trust in religion, we'll never know. We trust in Jesus Christ because it tells us in his word that he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin. 
The Bible is very clear on that. Have you called upon his name? Have you placed your faith in him? We have folks at the front who would be happy to talk with you more about this afterwards. They pray with you. If you have a question, they'll try to answer it right out of the Bible so that you can place your faith in Jesus Christ today. Let's all stand. We'll have a word of prayer here this morning. Father in heaven, we thank you for the promises that you have made to us. Promises, Lord, that you have demonstrated over and again your ability to fulfill. Lord, may we truly place our faith and trust in you for all things pertaining to this life. And most importantly, Lord, may we put our faith in you, knowing that you have the power to save us from our sin. And Lord, I lift up anyone here this morning who's not sure just lacking that assurance that they're on their way to heaven. May you work in their heart today and may they seek from the word of God the answers to their questions to lead them to place their faith in you and you alone. We give you praise for your testimony here of your word today and thank you for the time we've spent here in Jesus' name, amen. Don't forget if you're visiting with us here this morning, uh, we.